Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Got a special guest with me here today. This is Mr. Ray up here at Moss hanging out. You know, he's does a lot of our gunsmithing videos with us here and he's also been a long time kind of behind the scenes member of the channel for a long time and uh, we love having Ray on the channel today. We're going to be taking on a firearms fact for you. Uh, we've touched on this subject a little bit, but today we're going to be talking about the 9mm confusion. If you guys haven't seen our previous videos, make sure you check out the 22 confusion and the 308 confusion. We go over this whole kind of smorgasbord of different uh, bullet diameters and odd things that go on when people, you know, call a 22 a 22, a 308 a 308. In today's case, we're going to talk about 9 millimeters. Not all 9 millimeters are created equal. Um, there's so much confusion about 9 millimeter as a cartridge. That's very true. I mean, we get it a lot here in the store. Uh, people will come in and say, hey, I need some 9 millimeter. And, okay, you want 9 millimeter Luger? Do you want 9 millimeter Makarov? What are you looking for? So, we're going to try to get rid of some of the myths out there and show you the differences between the different 9 millimeter calibers. We're going to segue into some of the rifle stuff, talk about mostly the handgun stuff, and then talk about projectiles themselves and the differences between them. 9mm is a very old cartridge, guys. Uh, in terms of when most people think 9mm, they think 9mm Parabellum or 9mm Luger. Uh, Luger was one of the first widely adopted service pistols to use uh, or, you know, the 9mm cartridge. There were some Mauser broom handles that were later converted to accept 9mm, uh, but the Luger is probably one of the most uh, synonymous pistols with the 9mm as a cartridge. Um, it's a reasonably powerful cartridge, even in, in its original form. Uh, you know, you have a 355 diameter projectile moving at some pretty respectable speeds. It does have a mild taper to it. And it gets, when people say parabellum, parabellum literally uh, translates, translates to, to four war. Four war, yep. Okay, so uh, originally, you know, nine millimeter parabellum, four war, and then it kind of got a sort, sort of bastardized into nine millimeter Luger. It did, because mainly it was chambered in the Luger pistols, although not necessarily originally for that gun. They um, also developed it with, along with some other calibers that they were working on just to work towards the military um, acceptance of some of their stuff. Um, there were other oddities out there like the 9mm Mars and there was um, some of the early Bayards and such like that, but the 9mm Parabellum is the one that caught on because it picked up the military contract. That's right. And uh, you look at guns like the Brochard and stuff like the Steyr Roth and some of those really oddball uh, transitional uh, pistols that were coming out. The Mauser broom handle obviously had a lot of success with the 30 Mauser. Uh, this is not really intended to be a history lesson, but it's important to really know where the 9mm came from. And it was really one of the first widely adopted small bore automatic pistol cartridges to ever uh, take on, not only in military use, but in civilian use. So 9mm as we know today has had a long and storied history. Uh, it's been chambered in numerous uh, machine guns, pistols, uh, rifles, carbines. It is a, it's still an extremely widely used uh, cartridge and probably the most common pistol cartridge to find a, a pistol chambered in today, I would say. I would say pretty much the most popular caliber in the world handgun wise other than possibly 22 long rifle. Yeah, I, w I would say that's definitely the case. So when people come in and they're saying, hey, I want a box of nine millimeter, you're generally gonna say, okay, well, that's probably what somebody wants is a box of nine millimeter Luger for the myriad of random nine millimeter uh, Parabellum slash Luger pistols that are out there, okay? Yeah. And there's a little bit of confusion, okay? So when you start talking about 380, well, 380, as we know here, you know, in a lot of, of other places in the world, they call it nine millimeter curves. Or a yeah. yeah, a, mm -hmm. shor a shortened mm -hmm. nine millimeter. Yep. 380 is still a nine millimeter, it's just a shorter nine millimeter. So it, 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 you start getting into a little bit of confusion. Now you start getting into reloading and things, and you're getting into all of these different bullet diameters, which we're gonna go over in a moment. There are some varying bullet diameters um, for are. them all, you know, but the 380 generally uses a lighter projectile than the nine millimeter, but it's not to say that you can't use 380 projectiles and load light nine millimeter if you want to. So that gives you a couple of options there. Yeah, you but, certainly can. The bullet diameters are the same. Yeah. But that's where the confusion comes along is it says 380 on the box, but it's not. 
truly a 380 diameter. Correct. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion that goes on there. People say, you know, think 380 is sort of this different animal. And it is. It is a physically different chambering, but it is still a 9 millimeter diameter projectile. So it's it basically just think of it as a shortened 9 millimeter. No, the two are not interchangeable. Okay. And then you start getting into revolver cartridges. And we're just going to go down the line here in no particular order, but we've got some 357 Magnum. Well, when you start getting into 357 Magnum, well, in a 9 millimeter, you have 355 diameter projectiles. That's correct. In 357, you have 358s and 357s. That's so correct. So you've got some reloading projectiles down there. Got a couple of boxes here. These are the, just some Hornadies I grabbed off the uh, shelf over there. But these are the 355 diameter that you would normally load in your 9 millimeter Luger. Um, and these are the 357s that you'll load in 38 Special, 357 Magnum, 357 Maximum. And you can even load them in a 358 rifle, which we'll get into another time probably. And then we actually have truly 358 diameter, which are for most of your 35 caliber common rifles. Yep. So, so it can get confusing. Very when confusing people say 38 uh, caliber, you know, you really, it's nine millimeter. It's, it's sort of, it's, you know, it's, it's it falls, one of those weird things. Falls into that category. So you translate the diameter of nine millimeter to, um, you know, the, the standard, um, measurements and you come up with about 355. That's right. So, you know, it's, it's sort of this thing that gets lost in translation. Okay. So that's one thing we want to discuss. And then, you know, we have a couple of different things to show you here. I mean, one here obviously being 357 SIG. So again, now, now you're taking what is essentially a revolver projectile and putting it in a neck down pistol cartridge. So you would think, but <laughs> it actually uses nine millimeter handgun projectiles. Right. So they did not change the bore diameter. They just kept it the same as nine millimeter and took basically gave it a fancy the, name. <laughs> yeah, gave it a fancy name. Sig wanted to make their own brand. And they took a 40 caliber casing, originally necked it down to nine millimeter, and you got the 357 Sig. They had to make other um, concessions for necking it down so the cases actually are a little bit longer than the 40. But you got a nine millimeter projectile with more confusion calling it 357 which is not. Okay. So I guess it would be boring to call it 355 SIG. That wouldn't yeah, sound doesn't, right. Doesn't you got to call it 357 because in people's minds they think, oh, 357, that sounds powerful. They think of 357 Magnum. I see what they did there. All right, a little bit of marketing hype, okay. It, it is, and it's, it's naming the nomenclature because some things just don't sound right. If you were to call a 44 Magnum, which is truly a 429, who wants to say 429 Magnum? or 430 Magnum, that sounds like crap. 44 Magnum 44 got a sounds ring. good. It's got know? a ring to it. It just sounds better. And so <laughs> sometimes when you're getting ready to market something, just because it doesn't sound right, people won't buy it. Yeah, and that, that's part of it. So yeah. adding to the confusion, all right, we're going to yeah. get into the Makarov, okay? Nine millimeter Makarov. I can't tell you how many people have come in and bought the wrong ammo. And, and usually the common problem is not that they buy a 9mm Makarov to try to put in a regular 9mm pistol. They generally will try to fire standard 9mm Luger in a 9mm Makarov handgun. Uh, this uses a completely different diameter projectile. These are 365 diameter projectiles that are used in the Makarov pistol. Completely different bore diameter than 357 Magnum, 38 Special. Completely different bore diameter than the 9mm. And when you look at a lot of European rifles, this isn't necessarily a rifle video, but I will mention, you look at the 9.3 by 57, 9.3 by 62, they have 366, 365 diameters, just like the Makarov. So you can actually make gallery ammunition using 365 diameter Makarov projectiles that weigh 90 grains, and you can use a reduced load to make yourself some gallery loads for your 9.3. Right. It's kind of the same thing using, say, 380 projectiles, in a um, 357 lever gun, you can get away with it. It may not be the most accurate, but it's safe. You can do it. And um, same thing with 357 diameter projectiles and your 358 rifles. You can make a lighter gallery load or just you know, a little fox and coyote load, something that doesn't kick as hard if you want to train somebody on that particular gun. Something that, um, that may, a lot of people may not understand is the way that bore diameter is measured. And that's where sometimes they come up with this being nine millimeter, and this also being nine millimeter. So the inside diameter of a barrel, you've got the bore, which is drilled and it's smooth and round. And then you come back through and you either drag a button through it or a cutter of some form to form the rifling lands and grooves. So you're cutting the groove in it 
over the size of the bore. So some of the Europeans measure the land or the groove depth and not the land, which is the actual bore of the gun. So you add the number of thousandths that they decide to cut the groove on the barrel on each side, and that's where they come up with, say, the 365 diameter projectile versus the 355. Five thousandths on either side, you add that together, you get 10 and you get 365. And that's where some of those measurements come from. Another reason for the confusion. That's right. And there's a lot of that that tends to float around. I mean, if you hear people, you've heard, probably heard some people say, nine millimeter Mauser, what's that? But there's a lot of old school rifle cartridges that in many cases would be simply referred to as nine millimeter Mauser, such as 9.3 by 57 is what we know today as being an eight millimeter Mauser necked up to the 365. But when it first came out, people just simply referred to it as nine millimeter Mauser because it was a nine millimeter projectile, technically a 9.3. So see, even more of the confusion. So this would technically be not nine millimeter. It's 9.3 millimeter Makarov. But that sounds weird, right? That's just, just hard to package right, yep. and all. So just make it nine millimeter Makarov. Again, adding to the confusion. It does. It does. And then we got some Floberts here. Yeah, so this is something that's totally different. These Floberts are specifically a shot cartridge and they're nine millimeter. They fit a Flobert chamber. They don't fit anything else. Most of these were made for little pest control garden guns. They were real popular in Europe, Great Britain back in the you know, pre-World War II days mainly, but they did make some, and still I think make a few here and there, you know, boutique type guns. But again, nine millimeter, and it's gonna be on the bore diameter of the particular smooth bores that these are fired from. So yeah, they come out to be about nine, I'm sorry, 355, nine millimeter. And um, if you look at them, they're necked. Um, Eric's got the calipers on it there, and you can see that the diameter is 343, and then where it necks down, move down the case some. There you go. So that's .324. That gets into eight millimeter. So it necks down from nine to nine eight. Nine to eight, right. So the bore's tight, and that's so that they get a little bit of constriction on the shot pattern. And the rim fire. And the rim fire. Kind of oddball. Yep. But again, adding to the nine millimeter confusion, you know, you see something on a box that says nine millimeter, that, that term just kind of sticks around people's heads, but right. people don't know what flowberts are. And honestly, it's not common to find a box of flowberts laying around. Yeah, you're not gonna find one. If you do, you probably know what you're buying anyway, and it's not gonna be that confusing. So next thing we've got are 38 Supers, which sounds, sounds nice enough, but it's not what it sounds like. It's a nine millimeter. The projectiles on 38 Supers, What's really interesting is the original 38 Supers were 357 diameter, and later on, they decided might as well make it common with a nine millimeter, which it's you know, pretty common. Now they're 355, and they run the same projectiles nine millimeters do in general. But if you've got a very early Colt, it might have a little bit larger bore, and it might not shoot worth a damn, and that's why they got some of the bad reputation that they did for not shooting accurately, and they also try to headspace off of a semi-rim, which is a bad idea. Yeah. And uh, I think the, the biggest thing that keeps not, uh, the 38 Super around is when you look at countries such as Mexico, you know, mm -hmm. they aren't allowed to have pistols chambered in military cartridge, okay? So the answer to that, I suppose, is you have Colts that are chambered in 38 Super. That's a gun that they could have. A lot of the yep. Mexicans love their 1911s. They love Colts, love anything that says Colt on it. The 38 Supers are super popular, no pun intended, but super popular to them because they can't have a 40, they're not supposed to have 45 ACPs. Right. So it kind of stays around. Yeah, it runs the same way with a nine millimeter Luger cartridge since it was used everywhere in the world as a military cartridge. They can't illegally own it. So this was kind of an easy way for them to have something and the Mexican government just had to look the other way because of the way they wrote their laws. So. 38 Super has their, you know, kind of group of followers, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah it, it And then you look at, uh, when we did the Astra video, it was a Astra model, it was, either, I think of the mo model 400, 400 that we did yeah. the, the video on, it's chambered in uh, nine millimeter Largo, yes. which is not the same as 38 Super, not the same as nine millimeter Steyr for the nine millimeter no, Steyr Han, not. which is a completely different animal. So see, then you start getting into some of these quirky transitional nine millimeter cartridges that are kind of their own animal, right? And we've got one of those here at the very end, which is the 9x23 Winchester. 
So this, pap this particular cartridge is quite popular in Europe. It was brought about in the 80s, I think, for the um, international pistol competition, the IPSC. And uh, the Europeans liked it. It, uh, it was a cartridge case that they already had. Um, they souped it up a little bit, raised the pressures, chambered it in the 1911s, and it was very popular uh, for quite a long time. But mainly, it fell out of favor here in the States. It had a very small amount of popularity for just a few years. And uh, the people that were shooting IPSC competition mainly went to the 38 Super Comp, which is a rimless version of the 38 Super. This particular cartridge is identical in shape and size and length to the 9mm Largo. It's even a 9x23. You put this in a 9mm Largo Astra 400 and you're going to be eating the slide eventually. Yep. It's bad news. So that's why the confusion can be not just confusing, but dangerous and confusing. You got to know what you're putting in your gun or you could be eating parts of the gun that you don't want to. It's kind of along the same lines of looking at, like, say, the Mauser broom handles chambered in the original 30 Mauser cartridge. Yes. Some guy goes to a gun show, finds some, you know, 762 by 25 Tokarev ammo, goes, oh, wow, this will fit in my broom handle. Mm -hmm. It'll chamber, it'll fire, fire a few times. and <laughs> maybe a mag in, you're going to blow the gun up. Yeah, you're probably going to be lucky and just break the bolt um, retaining retainer, yeah. <laughs> uh, but more likely you're going to break that and the bolt and possibly even eat the bolt. I mean, they're, they're, the original broom handles are not stupid strong guns, no, they're not. but there's definite pressure differences between the Tokarev cartridge and getting into the 30 Mauser. So there's a lot of those things that go on in the 9mm as well, and there's a lot of oddball, weird, transitional 9mm cartridges that you'll only see show up for a little while. You know, not a lot of people are familiar with 9mm Largo. You know, we've done a video on the Steyr Han, which uses is a completely different cartridge. It does. Uh, it's not a 9mm Largo, it's not a 38 Super, uh, you know, it's kind of its own animal, the 9mm Steyr, yeah. uh, which is a great cartridge in its own regard, and uh, I believe Fi uh, Fiocchi also loads that. They do. Fiocchi loads a lot of oddball European cartridges and things, so you're going to see that kind of popping up here and there. Um, Let's talk about the last cartridge that we're going to talk about. Now, we don't have it to show you. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit about the energy of 9 uh, by 25 Dillon. That is a neat cartridge. So yeah. the, the Dillon was a um, brainchild of, uh, of Mr. Dillon, and it's basically a 10 millimeter neck down to nine millimeter bottleneck case. And it's really interesting. It produces uh, fairly high pressures, 36,000 PSI or better, and velocities can be extremely fast. So you can take 90 grain pills to about 2,000 feet per second in that caliber. And energy levels over 800 foot pounds and that's in a 1911 sized format. You can get barrels to drop in your Glock that are just a drop in fit. I do recommend heavier recoil springs for it, but the gun will run and it's a, um, it's a stout load. It's an excellent, the 9x25 excellent Dillon does not play around. Not at all. Um, for a long time, the only projectile that was really recommended for that cartridge was a 90 grain spear gold dot. Um, just because of its robust construction, the Spear Gold Dot is an excellent bullet. It has really good weight retention, and it's it's really robust projectile. And the centrifugal force that 9x25 Dillon generates is so powerful that projectiles of lesser construction and lesser quality will literally shoot cool apart point. in the air because of the, the a high amount of centrifugal force that the board is imparting on that cartridge and the high velocity that thing is leaving the barrel. 9x25 Dillon is a ridiculously powerful handgun cartridge and it is considered a 9mm. Now granted, you're is. basically running a 90 grain 380 pill technically, technically. because 90 grains is kind of light medicine for a standard 9, but it's kind of par for the course for a 380. So that's right. where it gets even more confusing because people think they go to buy 90 grain projectiles like, wait a minute, 90 grains is a little light for a 9mm, but the two are pretty much interchangeable. Those 90 grain spears are a great projectile and they work exceptionally well. And like he said, the, the pressures are pretty silly, but when you compare 10 millimeter to 44 Magnum, and then you start looking at 9x25, you can clearly see that 9x25 Dillon is kind of on the upper echelon of handgun cartridges in 9 millimeter. Yes, it produces more energy than average in 44 Magnum load. And the, the cool part about it is, is there are some much better projectiles there out nowadays than the Spear Gold Dot, which is still a great bullet, but Lehigh's got some of their solids that we're going to probably visit here shortly and 
been thinking about building another 9x25, so might see some of that on the video in the near future. I think it's that sounds like a plan. And, and some of those of extreme fun. penetrators, oh, yeah. some of those brass solids getting out of there at some stupid speeds. How about we fun. take one of the high points and jerk the barrel out of it and put a 9x25 barrel in it and see what happens? <laughs> Well, that might be a little bit outlandish there, yeah, but I don't you know, know if what? They'll ever produce that one for We're us, known for outlandish, so yeah. we'll do that. Um, Push the limits, right? You know, so speaking of like the upper echelon of nine millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier briefly uh, 357 maximum. Um, yes. That's tell them a little bit about 357 maximum, because a lot of people don't know that it's basically a 357 magnum magnum. It pretty much is. So they, what they did is um, the gun was the cartridges were probably mainly developed by Lee Juris back in the 60s and uh, mainly with uh, Thompson Center single shots in mind but he took um, brass that he made turned himself and kept extending the length of say the standard 44 Magnum 41 Magnum and 357 Magnum out to approximately 1.6 inches and in doing so you keep pressures roughly the same as a 357 Magnum but you can bump the powder charge up by about 20 percent so that also increases velocity and allows you to get the same performance almost as 44 Magnum out of a 357 bore and with that same gun so in a revolver or in the TC or whatever it may be you can chamber standard 357 Magnum 38 special and fire those if you need lighter loads or if you're in a pinch you don't have 357 maximum brass. Interesting. Yeah the idea is kind of similar to making the 9 by 25 Dillon, except for you've got a more versatile chambering. You can shoot multiple different calibers in it. So hmm. yeah, That was going to be my question, is how the 357 Maximum stacks up against 44 Magnum and stacks mm -hmm. up against 9.3 by, or well, not 9 by 50, 25 Dillon. I'm sorry, I'm getting my calibers mixed up. Yeah, energy-wise, it's going to be fairly close to the it's 44 a lot to know. Magnum. But in, in working terms, it's probably a little less overall. Um, you certainly don't have the bullet mass that the 44 Magnum does, so the penetration is going to be limited compared to the Magnum. But we're getting a little off track here, but you know it's it's interesting to know. There's all kinds of stuff we could talk about for hours on end oh, yeah. that translate you know closely to the nine millimeter. This just as easily could have been nine millimeter Smith and Wesson Magnum as it could have been 357. Yeah, not to mention yeah, exactly getting into like 38 Smith and Wesson versus 38 mm -hmm. Special, and then all. Oh, yeah. oh gosh, there's so many rabbit holes that we could go down in this video. This is just scratching the surface, but hopefully this gave you some food for thought. This gave you something to think about. Maybe this will merit a little bit of research on your end, and you can see just how many different nine millimeters there really are out there. And that really, when you think nine millimeter Luger, you're really only scratching the surface to what is really out there. I would strongly recommend, if you guys are into reading, you like books, pick up the Cartridges of the World. You were reading uh, my mind, weren't you? I yeah, was just gonna mention that. I was, I was, I was on your wavelength. Yep, the, uh, uh, Cartridges of the World is great. It's got a ton of awesome stuff in it. A little esoteric at times, but if you're looking for knowledge and it's very well written, it's simple. Generally, it's one page per cartridge with a little bit of history, a little bit of performance, and some loading data. So you get a great overview of the cartridge, a lot of dimensional drawings in that book as well. Um, it's great reference tome if you're into guns for any reason at all. Get one. It's good. I agree. You know, because a lot of times, too, you have to think, it's awesome to know the differences between some of these because you never know when you might be at a gun show or, you know, have a specimen in your hands that you're looking at. And you may not know what caliber it is. So a little bit of study will help you merit, you know, have a little bit of uh, knowledge there to allow you to go, oh, well, that's an Astra 400. Well, then I, I know because I've studied and I've researched it, I know that that's not just a regular 9mm. I know it's a 9mm Largo, which is a different that's, cartridge. That's so right. a little bit of study can help go a long way in making you a more well-informed gun owner and making sure that, most importantly, not only are you well-informed, but you don't do something dangerous and accidentally put the wrong cartridge in a gun and hurt you or someone else or damage the firearm uh, in irreparable. Definitely. Important. We definitely want to keep our subscribers so you guys pay attention to what we're talking about on these <laughs> cartridges here because we don't want to have you guys not been able to watch us because you blew your face off or popped an eye out or lost some fingers and you can't punch the keyboard right so very bad day yeah, yeah, yeah. all right be very be very careful ray thanks That's for good. hanging out today no problem man. i enjoyed it yeah man yep. uh we'll guys more yeah thanks very much for watching today's video we really appreciate you guys uh, we always love to come and commandeer moss for a little while and hang out and show off some cool stuff um, this has been the 9mm Confusion. 
Maybe you're more confused. Maybe you're less confused. Maybe you're not confused, but there's some confusion in there somewhere. Uh, guys, thanks so much for watching today's video. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll have many more on the way. We're actually about to film another confusing vi video, but that's uh, for another day. Confusion sure or confusing? Confucius. Confucius, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, have All yourselves right. a great day. We'll see you next time. Many more videos on the way. Thank you for watching.